So uh, I don't want to stress the football uh, analogy too much, but I hope you don't mind me calling an audible at the line of scrimmage. Um, just, yeah, and I never thought I would ever use, the after that last session, I would ever use the word knuckle-dragging clinical researcher. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really what I feel like. Um, that was such a, a wonderful erudite uh, session, and I want to really drag you guys uh, back into the clinical realm and talk about some of the real practical problems of trying to do um, uh, nutrition intervention. And I, I do feel after being here for two days that uh, I've just been sort of kidding myself doing nutrition alone. There's so much more to it. Uh, but that's where I am, and so, and I guess that's why you want to be up here, so here I am. So, you know, I thought um, that we had the answer. <clears throat> um, I know I'm in Pennsylvania, and the answer is supposed to be Allen Iverson, right? But, um, <laughs> the, um, but uh, in March, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association published the primary prevention guidelines for cardiovascular disease, and I was thrilled to be um, uh, on this panel, as I mentioned, and we really worked on um, these seven domains. And they're clearly, if we had had this meeting before our you know, sessions uh, uh, where we talked about what it is we were gonna talk about, there's some big areas here, um, such as mindfulness and you know, socioeconomic um, influences and um, you know, lifestyle stresses and things that we just didn't deal with. Uh, and it isn't that the literature isn't there, it's just not the kinds of things that we're exposed to. So, um, so it isn't, anyway, this is a long-winded introduction to thank you for putting this on and inviting me and sort of opening my mind to talk about more than just the thing that I've been focusing on, which is nutrition. But getting back to that, um, you know, we did try to make a, a quantum leap in terms of nutrition um, and making recommendations that we thought would, were evidence-based you notice that there's only one that's a level one, and even that um, level one meaning this is highly recommended. Um, the level of evidence is B, which means it's not that good, uh, but there is a little bit of randomized data. Um, and you know, I, I took a lot of uh, flack from our uh, American College of Cardiology nutrition group, which I kind of call the vegan mafia of cardiology. Um, because it included fish, but when there were randomized trials include fish, uh, they, they lower stroke, it's not lower mortality in the PREDIMED trial, it did not lower um, uh, heart attack, but it did lower stroke, and so the combined endpoint of a 30% reduction can't be ignored. Um, but we did have some data for replacement of saturated fat and reducing cholesterol uh, and sodium, and we really had, a, a, I thought, fairly good evidence for reducing uh, processed meat, uh, refined carbohydrates, sweetened beverages, um, but uh, sort of in, in controversy, these got um, uh, adjudicated down to level 2A, um, whereas some people thought that they, along with trans fats, which are now illegal uh, in the United States, um, Denmark, um, uh, Canada, and Switzerland, um, that they should be a level 3 harm. and so. You know, this is it's an iterative process. Hopefully, we'll go back at it again. And what was missing? What, why couldn't we get level three? Um, you know, we don't have level three for scissors. We don't have level three for cigarettes, randomized trials. I mean, uh, we don't have uh, randomized trials for, you know, parachutes uh, in airplanes. And so um, you, you can't, uh, as David Katz pointed out, you can't have a randomized trial for everything. It's not appropriate. And, and a lot of these things, like processed meats and, and the like, probably should not be subjective, but you'll have people arguing uh, very well that uh, without that data, you'll never get to where you want to be. So I want to talk just uh, uh, two minutes, and I'll yield back uh, uh, most of my time, uh, because this is very short, um, even though I'm breaking with attrition by showing a bunch of slides, uh, because so many people asked me about the church intervention that we did. So many of you wanted to know more about it, so if it's OK, yeah, this is the audible. Um, we actually did do a five-week intervention um, of a del home delivery of um, completely vegetarian, non-dairy foods, did baseline um, uh, sort of metabolic screening and um, vitals, and um, we plugged it into, hopefully everybody has the 10-year um, risk score. It's an app on your phone. It's a wonderful party tool. You pull, tell your friends what, 
uh, hi, Uncle Fred, what's your cholesterol? What's <laughs> and, you, and you put everything in. You have a 14.6% 10-year incidence, and you need to see your doctor. It's a wonderful tool. We at um, uh, What HEART stands for is we, when I got to Rush, um, just about the same month that the calculator came out, we started actually going into community groups, and you know it's not just African American. Uh, you know we did the Polish community. We did we went Chicago Veggie Fest, which is a suburban uh, community, and we actually looked at um, you know the risk and everyone assessing risk. And so Heart stands for helping everyone assess risk today. And so uh, we uh, did this in the African American church multiple times, and then it's kind of like why don't we just do something about it? And that's where this came from. So for when I found out that uh, it had become common in the African-American community to give up something for Lent, usually fried chicken or sort of sweetened beverages, uh, I said, why not? And uh, we got some volunteers uh, to really do this. Um, this is a church that's very famous uh, on the south side of Chicago because uh, of the former pastor, Jeremiah Wright, and all the controversy of the things that he said when he was supporting Obama, my goodness. Um, but it's actually a wonderful church. All oh, those folks are long gone, and, and um, uh, they really are sort of interested in health, but they s have a fair amount of difficulty, even though they put on nutrition classes and lifestyle classes, uh, a lot of tr difficulty with uptake. And so um, uh, having friends there and uh, a guy named uh, Dr. Terry Mason, who's the uh, chief of the Chicago Department of Public Health, um, in that church as one of their sort of health ministers, uh, with his encouragement, we went in and tried to do something about it. Now, our strategy uh, for the heart program really has been to try to reach the uh, at-risk community with the screening programs, detect the risk, uh, discuss access to care, um, but, uh, you know, strategy has to have tactics. And when I'm seeing patients, I always talk about the three T's. Uh, the time with me, the time with my team, which education and uh, nutrition, medication adherence, coaching lifestyle uh, exercise, and the tools. We give a lot of handouts. Uh, the Association of Black Cardiologists came out with a, 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 a essentially a vegan, very low salt, very healthy um, uh, cookbook. If you have African American patients, they will re resonate with this. Uh, you can you know, reach the Association of Black Cardiologists online and, and order them. They're free. Uh, but that bullet point number three, you know, we can strategize all we want, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, as uh, Pete Drucker used to say, and that breakfast is high in fat, high in sodium, high in cholesterol, <laughs> refined grains, and sugar. And we have a lot, you know, when you're talking about making a culture ch cultural change like this, you're attacking their family, the, a lot of times their church, um, uh, how they grew up, and it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. So anyway, we went after it with this five-week uh, ACCHA guideline, minus the fish, of course, but uh, everything else was consistent with what the guidelines say. Our, you know, 53 people signed up instead of 50, which was what we were aiming for, but only 44 completed it for a variety of reasons, uh, a lot of which were people couldn't come back on Easter. They thought they could, and then they couldn't come back on Easter Sunday to get their blood testing, which meant that they were out of the study, even though I fed them for five weeks um, with uh, our philanthropy money at Rush. Um, we did uh, cardiometabolic risk. That church was substantially lighter, 440 pounds li lighter, um, an average of 10 pounds per person. The nutritional breakdown was right in that, uh, if, if, if folks saw that um, Seidelman article in Lancet Public Health talking about how bad a ketogenic low carb diet is and increased mortality, but also how bad the high carb diet is, this was right happened to be in the sweet spot of 58% carbohydrates, and it's not refined carbohydrates. Uh, so it was actually a, a, turned out to be a very good vegan diet. And this was, you know, what I mentioned yesterday, a 43% drop in insulin levels. So this diabetic, pre-diabetic, high incidence, high uh, body mass index uh, population uh, with hypertension and dyslipidemia had significant improvements. Interesting that 2% um, uh, change in the hemoglobin A1C was actually the most highly significant, believe it or not, because it was so consistent. It happened to everyone who changed their diet. Uh, so tiny amount, huge um, uh, consistency. Uh, the 43% decrease in trimethylamine and oxide, I know there's some of you who are, don't spend a lot of time in the cardiovascular space or Cleveland Clinic, uh, please Google TMAO because it would go along the outside of my time frame here, but it, you know, we've been focusing on saturated fat and cholesterol and, oh, then NIH said it's heme iron. You eat animals and you get heme iron and it's going to kill your arteries. Well, TMAO is probably the worst actor of them all. 
Uh, so please Google that one and look at Stan Hazen's uh, work and um, to see that going vegetarian, as Stan Hazen's group predicted, when you stop eating animal products, this, this uh, will fall. And you can feed a vegan a steak and they will not have a rise in TMAO because of the improvement in the microbiome. So in just five weeks, the TMAO level dropped dramatically, putting them in a much lower risk uh, area. But, you know, the 20% drop in LDL, um, one, one of the other big, big differences was the drop in LP little a, which most people think is a genetic risk factor that can't be modified. Apparently it can, and this is, believe it or not, after I studied it, this is actually the sudden, the second uh, vegan intervention. Houston, um, Houston's uh, Baxter Montgomery uh, did an African-American population, saw exactly a 10% fall in LP little a with um, a vegan intervention. Um, so we saw dramatic improvements in these markers. Um, when we plugged all of the, the people into the, um, the uh, app for AS, uh, the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, um, we saw about a 19% decrease in risk. And that's important because, uh, as you probably are aware, African Americans have about a 20 21% increase in cardiovascular risk. Now, I mean, getting them down to the risk of other Americans is not exactly what we're hoping to do. And so, but, you know, this was really an only a five-week intervention. Obviously, there's a lot of limitations. It wasn't randomized. It's volunteers only. There, this was a religious inducement because they were used to giving up something for Lent. Um, you know, we lost some data. We, the follow-up was actually, you know, they all, everyone signed a consent form saying, I will, you know, tell you how I'm doing in three to six months, and only about three-quarters of them have. Um, fairly expensive, and then the whole idea, I know, not to upset the vegans in the room, but that aphorism, give a man a fish versus, uh, you know, teach a man to fish. And so um, we really needed to do something else with coaching, something that was more sustainable. And so, you know, it's, it's just a beginning, uh, but I think we, we learned a lot. And I, I, what I'm hoping is that um, this kind of sort of pilot study would get more of the clinicians interested in doing interventions. Um, now, the question is, how do you fund this sort of thing? We were funding it through, you know, generous phil phil philanthropic uh, endeavors that we have at Rush. Um, but we need to make these uh, really vigorous and uh, really robust, uh, larger trials. And uh, none of this is really easy. Now, I know I was supposed to talk about, uh, you know, research and um, uh, integration. I learned everything I know about integration from this meeting, so you'll have to forgive me, <laughs> okay? It's really about, uh, I'm really into nutrition, and I'm, I'm hoping to uh, expand my understanding. Uh, and with that, I'll yield back my time to Victoria. Okay. Good morning, um, I'm Victoria Mazes, and I'm the executive director of the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. I wanna thank Mike and uh, Yoram for inviting me to be here. It's been just a fascinating meeting. I am passionate about prevention, which I'm guessing everyone in the room is too, so I have a question. Why isn't prevention in the lifestyle medicine definition? I would just argue that maybe you wanna add it. <laughs> so because I'm passionate about prevention, when uh, the diabetes prevention uh, program study was published in 2002, I was really excited. I'm like, finally, there's data to show that prevention works. So for those of you who need a reminder, the diabetes prevention program published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, 2002, about 3,200 people were studied. They were in three groups. There was a lifestyle, usual lifestyle recommendations group plus a placebo pill. There was a lifestyle recommendation group plus metformin. And then there was an intensive lifestyle uh, group. In the intensive lifestyle group, there were case managers who met with people people 16 times, weekly to begin with and then less frequently, and work with them closely with the goals of 5 to 7% weight loss, a low fat, 
low calorie diet, we may not choose that today, um, and 150 minutes of exercise per week. So what happened? Well, the people who took metformin had about a 31% um, lower risk of going from pre-diabetes, these were people at high risk of diabetes, to actual diabetes. But the people who received the intensive lifestyle had a 58% reduction of going from prediabetes to diabetes. And if you were over 60, you actually had a 71% reduction in risk in moving from prediabetes to diabetes. That was so exciting to me. It cost $1,500 per person, and the number needed to treat was seven. That's a great number needed to treat for prevention. So, of course, we would expect from 2002 on, we had good evidence-based medicine now for everybody to have this available, right? Wrong, nothing happened. It wasn't made available, and that's because we don't have the equivalent of pharmaceutical detailers who teach us or teach our patients how to recommend lifestyle. Um, so this is how it works, of course. The person is sitting there, the really caring physician is sitting with the patient, and he says, change all your bad habits today. And of course, the patient says, okay, right? This is how it works. Anyone have this experience in their clinical practice? I mean, rarely it works this way, but it is rare. We know this, you know, smoking is probably the classic example. So um, it was only um, in 2009, thanks to a physician uh, at the University of Indiana, Dr. Ackerman, who partnered with the Y. And in partnering with the Y, he moved from individual diabetes prevention program to a group model. It cut the cost from $1,500 per person to $200 per person, and was almost as effective, very minor differences. And because of the success of that, it actually became a Medicare de demonstration project. The Center for Medicare Innovation put in $12 million, and now actually it is available through Medicare and through partnerships with the Y, which means one of the things we have to think about to be effective is how do we partner in our community? We all know that these brief visits we have with patients, although I have the luxury of 90 minutes in my integrative medicine consultations, but that's another story, but our brief visits are not enough for successful lifestyle change. So how are we going to work with people to really help them make the changes that we know would benefit them? So fast forward to the research I want to speak about, and that's that at the University of Arizona, we developed a model for integrative primary care. And the model is as follows. We have fellowship-trained primary care physicians and nurse practitioners, um, so they have um, a two-year fellowship in integrative medicine. And then we have five additional services that are available. We have a health coach so that they can work with people on behavior change. We have mind-body practitioner, manual medicine, acupuncture, and nutrition. And in addition to that, we have group visits, for example, on optimal weight loss, and we also have uh, classes like Tai Chi and yoga to help people develop new habits. And um, we enrolled our patients um, in a comparative effectiveness trial, so not an RCT, but we were able to get two large employers, Maricopa County and also the Salt River Project, to um, agree to uh, offer this benefit to their uh, employees. And that meant we were going to have data to compare those employees' uh, medical costs, pharmacy costs, hospitalizations, emergency visit, um, and be able to do a cost effectiveness and utilization, which we haven't talked much about. But you know, we need to show that lifestyle medicine saves money. Otherwise, why should anyone invest in it? We should just keep going with stents, right? We know stents don't work. Okay, so we need to do the cost effectiveness, and that actually isn't really being funded. PCORI, which you would imagine would look at cost effectiveness, actually doesn't. So what did we find in our study? And if I had known I could have lots of slides, this one wouldn't be so complex. But we did three parts of our study. The first was fidelity. So when we said that we were delivering integrative medicine, were we really delivering integrative medicine? And so on 10 different days, we did random sampling of patients. And indeed, 99% of the patients felt that their doctor explained things clearly. 96% said they discussed specific intervention to improve health. 
95% said they helped them to change habits, 94% carefully listened, attended to their emotional well-being. This amazes me. 93% of the people said that the doctor cared about their health as much as they did. That's really remarkable. I think that's because we have um, a, a, an agreement that's signed by both the patient and their physician that's called a partnership agreement, where the patient and the physician both talk about the eight different domains of well-being and healthy behaviors that they are going to commit to, and then the patient points to what are the ones they want to work on first. So you can see from the fidelity um, results, we really did do a very good job in delivering integrative medicine. Then we have patient reported outcomes. And um, you can see, once again, uh, I don't have, uh, these are all the ones that showed st statistically significant improvements. General health, physical health, and mental health on the SF12, uh, reduced stress response, work impairment um, overall, presenteeism were improved, well-being overall was improved, pain, fatigue, anxiety, depression, and sleep quality all improved. Now, what I don't have for you is specific clinical outcomes. For example, did their diabetes get better? Did their hypertension get better? And that's because none of the ends were large enough. This was a diverse group of primary care people who came in for clinical care. So we looked at that, but I don't have that data. And then the bottom is perhaps the most important, and we haven't published this data yet. The other two studies are published, and you can look in much greater extent at the data. But we just analyzed this data. Um, it took a long time to get the claims data, much longer than one would expect, and then to clean that up. So um, what we found was a $2,700 per person lower cost than um, an age and condition and multiple other matched um, population who received care as usual from other primary care doctors that was covered by their employer. So $2,700 of savings. Um, I think that's pretty impressive for a lifestyle-based clinic. Um, emergency department visits were reduced by 13% and hospital admissions were reduced by 5%. So when I think about research in integrative medicine or lifestyle medicine, I just want to argue for complexity. We need to be thinking about packages of care. I think we have enough studies that show exercise is helpful, or stress reduction, or learning coping strategies is helpful, or nutritional interventions make a difference. But what we don't have very many studies, and you know, bless Dean Ornish for being one of the first ones who really did this, how do we look at the complex packages of care? And how do we look at it in a way where the patients get to say, this is what I care about most. These are my preferences on what I want to work on first or second or third. And therefore, the care is individualized based on our patient's preferences. And then we have to influence our funders to look at costs because we are bankrupting our country with our current healthcare non-system and we must look at costs if we are going to be doing anything uh, to change the health of Americans. Thank you. I'm Gary Fraser, I'm from Loma Linda University. For 30 or 40 years I've uh, been involved with the Adventist Health Studies. And how could I not um, respond to some of the things you said? Because in some ways, for 50 years, the publications that have come out again and again really, uh, in a way, reflect an integrative process that the Adventists have experienced. Um, I mean, they've got the dietary thing about half are vegetarian, half are not. They have a respect for physical activity. They've got the social support. Um, and a number of things. So there's some kind of integration going on there in the spirituality as well, if you like that. And I mean, what we've found is just so much in line with what we've found and reported time and again. Paper just came out last week as compared to a US census population now. Mortality rates are 30% lower. Our incidence of cancer in total is 30, 35% lower, hugely significant not due to chance, something's going on. And uh, rates of diabetes, when we compare the vegetarian to the non-vegetarian Adventists in black subjects as well, as I think you know, uh, Dr. Williams, are uh, about half for most of these risk factors, right in line with what you s saw, but these are long-term studies, non-randomized, of course, 
but in a way it's kind of a natural experiment that's going on comparing all the vegetarians to the non-vegetarians, all Adventists, or comparing Adventists to the non-Adventists in the same communities. So the, the one suggestion I would make, and it's something that's intrigued me a little bit, is we've never really had a good study of what are the dynamic forces that underlie the success of that population being able to be countercultural, if you like, in ways that we would now understand to be helpful, and what are the forces that have made that a success? And we don't really understand a lot of that. We've got a lot of ideas, but no one's really stood that. So here's a free living population that has done a lot of these things for decades, and we don't fully understand just how to do that and how it could be translated perhaps to others in the population. I think in a less politically correct venue, they call them positive deviants, right? <laughs> what can we do to learn from the outliers? But go ahead, Kim or Victoria. Well, I, I would say that I've been very impressed. Uh, you know, I talked about the you know, ABC cookbook, for example. But, and tools are important, but I would think that in modern society, the biggest tool is social media and you know, uh, actually uh, the, the film media. Uh, and so the number of people who come to me at Rush because I was in What the Health and the Game Changers uh, is Im important. And I have to admit, I was a little embarrassed to be speaking at the Montreal Vesery Festival up in French Canada. And I found out that there was a film about health nutrition in the black community <laughs> in the inner city. I, I saw it for the first time up there. I just hadn't, hadn't heard of it because they didn't market it like, you know, the Game Changers were marketed by... You know, when you're working with James Cameron, you know, like the Titanic uh, and the other thing, you know, uh, Terminator, uh, they know how to market a movie. Um, but this one, uh, it's, it's called uh, The Invisible Vegan, and it really grapples with the African-American people and all of the challenges of trying to change the culture and change the nutrition away from uh, what we essentially have honestly uh, derived from slavery. And uh, it's been, you know, all, all those years, it still persists uh, in the African American community. And now, as I mentioned yesterday, everyone's paying for it, not just uh, we pay for it in terms of illness and mortality, but cost wise, it's, it's a burden on everyone. Um, so I would say, uh, whatever we can do to get out into the public space uh, through the media is probably going to have the, the best uh, of results knowing that we're going to be fought by very powerful media forces, the incredible edible, are you kidding me? It shows mortality. It was published in February. You know, um, and that w there will be those market forces, and I know Dave uh, Katz talked about this last night, um, but you have to be out there you know, pushing against all that. Eduardo? Um, great presentations. Thank you so much. Eduardo Sanchez. I work for the American Heart Association. Um, a couple of things. One, I love the fact that mentioned the people who are being served. It's critically important as we do this work to keep engaging um, people, patients, um, whatever word we want to use. And it's critically important to know what they want um, as we move forward and um, think about success through the eyes and the lens of um, patients. Um, I'd go a step further and say um, we need to begin thinking about health teams as um, um, including uh, the patient, him or herself. And I think too often it's not, that's not the way we necessarily do it. Um, I've got a couple of thoughts, though. One is patients felt their position, and that just sort of ties back to the health team. Um, we won't change our paradigm if we don't start asking people about how the whole, the whole experience went from the front desk to all that were involved. Um, and then um, lastly, um, uh, I wonder about um, with regards to cost and utilization, um, uh, um, uh, um, not so much cost and utilization, what was the uptake uh, of the program? So it was offered as a benefit. Who took advantage of it? Um, because, as you know, that's going to introduce a little bit of bias. But the flip of that is, with this cost and utilization outcome data, can you go to an employer and say, and maybe it was offered for free anyway, but with other employers, you can make the case this could be a no-cost service because here's what it returns in terms of the ROI. Um, 
Um, thank you for those questions. Um, we actually did ask about um, all the members of the healthcare team. I just can only show you a little bit of data. And so it is published from the receptionist to the nurses to the, um, the office manager. And um, um, I agree, you know, I think we really have to value all the members of the team and, and they really have a big impact in the person's experience. Um, I didn't mention this, but um, both employers, Maricopa County and Salt River Project, paid 80% of the membership fee. The membership fee was $500 a year, and it wasn't for access, so it's not concierge. It was for services, so those services were the health coach, acupuncture, manual medicine, mind-body nutrition, and the classes. Um, half of the revenues from the clinic come from that membership fee, and that allows the um, clinic to have long physician visits. So initial visits were 60 minutes and returns were 30. So we do feel we could go to an employer and say, this is cost effective care for you. This saves money over time. Um, and we'll see what the uptake is. John. Let's see. Uh, my name is John Mayer and I'm here at the University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Family Medicine. So, and Mike has been, I'm outside of the uh, lifestyle medicine community, but Mike has been working to educate me over these many years. So um, I've been fascinated uh, yesterday, all day, and uh, that through all this conversation, there's not been a more formal articulation of religious affiliation uh, in concert with lifestyle medicine work. You know, it, there's an obvious overlap with the things like uh, social connectedness and mindfulness, even with nutrition, with various religious traditions having things like avoiding certain foods or taking certain uh, nutrition-related um, exercises during their practice. Um, and so to get to something maybe that could be part of the white paper recommendation, at the very least, there's an opportunity to ask participants in research studies about, you know, do they assert a religious affiliation? And if they do, do they do think practices on a regular basis related to that? That's kind of a minimum thing, but the higher level is to do what you did. You know, do actually studies, Gwen mentioned pragmatic studies in the environment, but ally with um, religious groups uh, to do those studies. There's an opportunity there. I appreciate that that can be complex politically with people and uh, that that can be complicated. So a, a way to talk about that is, you know, religion as an example of a cultural distinguisher. You know, and in looking at lifestyle medicine interventions, we want to look at groups of people who have something about them that asserts their culture as distinct from the ambient toxic culture. Religion is one of those, maybe veganism is one of those, but maybe couching it in th that language would help people be less afraid of, of dealing with, um, you know, potentially doing a research study in a religious group. But I, I, I was delighted that it finally came up, and I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated that it hasn't been more part of the conversation, but I think there's ways to move it forward in terms of the research that um, could be helpful. Um, one of the things I would say is that in integrative medicine, we have a slightly different domain, definition of the domains. Um, so um, we include spirituality um, and ask questions about um, sources of strength, purpose and meaning, religious affi affiliation as part of our intake. Um, and then we also include environmental uh, health and environmental exposure. So the domains are close, but not exactly the same. And I totally agree with you. Um, sometimes that's the most important thing. And it did come up yesterday, I think, in Eva's presentation, because you know, when you get to someone's sense of purpose and meaning, then suddenly their That's motivation to do the thing, and you said that too, Eddie, their, the, their um, willingness to do the thing that you're hoping they'll do is then, um, from a deep source of, um, you know, much lower, deeper source of connection to the goal than just, well, I should do this because my doctor said I should do it. That's a, uh, wonderfully said, and, uh, you know, I have to admit that we use that as a clinical opportunity. I mean, one of the best things that you can do as a clinician is to find out where the patient is and try to move them from that point. And so many of our patients, particularly in this age group, maybe not the younger group, but in, in the age group that we're seeing in coronary disease, uh, do have a religious background. And, uh, you know, we're able to try to glom onto that and because they do have a sense of purpose. And, um, you know, and if they're, you know, purpose is the Great Commission, I tell them, that, you know, you, you can't do that if you're sick or dead. It doesn't work. And, um, and you know, so many of our fundamental religions uh, believe in the first five books, the Torah, you know, so Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. 
And so I point them to Genesis 129, which basically says you're supposed to eat, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables. That's your diet. And so, you know, obviously the old principle when you take the text out of the context, all you're left with is the con. So I'm very <laughs> careful about that. Um, but, but, but having said that, uh, I do tease them that if you know if you don't believe me, that's one thing. But if you don't believe the Word of God, I think you got bigger problems than bigger problems. <laughs> Um, but it resonates. It always gets a laugh. And I and thought I cardiologists were God. Exactly. <laughs> oh, gosh, no? right? okay. I wish we could have a little bit more omnipotence and, uh, and get people to, to change their behavior. Um, so I, I, I do agree that you know faith-based initiatives are, are good, but you know we are hopefully going to be able to you know spread beyond that. But certainly taking this as a clinical opportunity, I think, is something that we all should embrace. All right, Debbie. Hi. So I'm um, Debbie Snyder. I'm in family and lifestyle medicine. I am not a researcher, but actually now more than ever, I wish I was. So in um, you know, um, assimilating all the comments and great presentations, um, you know, it's definitely true. I think we're all very passionate about lifestyle medicine. We all know it works, and that's what everybody should be doing. But we're all, I think, also very frustrated that although we're doing all of this to promote the field, it's not moving faster. So you know, looking at this cost and utilization, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, you know, we have other studies that show cost and utilization measures like Geisinger, there was, an, I think it was $8,000 reduction for every point of hemoglobin A1C that you lowered. So I'm proposing to our great group of scientists and researchers, and I would certainly help, but I, this is not my field of expertise, but a meta-analysis as a start. You know, maybe one of the most powerful things we can do as a group is to start with a meta-analysis and show the cost reduction because, you know, and, and publish it in a big journal so that we get some media attention because, of course, media um, determines, you know, the public perception, unfortunately, and culture, and I think there's some um, also overlap with, with policy. So I think we really need to start with the pocketbook. Well, I'll, if I may take a prerogative here, this is a space that I, I've worked in, as Debbie knows, and as my colleague Dexter, for over 20 years with large employers. And uh, it's really about the business value in a globally competitive economy that is ruthless and unforgiving to say that if you don't have the healthiest, lowest cost workforce that shows up every day at 100% performance, you will not win. And to that end, uh, the notion of where does the data live, Debbie, that is big enough or good enough or sound enough to do a meta-analysis, it's just not there. As Dexter knows, and uh, Dexter was with the genius who helped build the LiveWell Center, if there's not anybody who's Googled Cummins LiveWell Center, please do. It's the next generation employer healthcare because they're frankly fed up with hospitals and doctors who don't do w reverse type two diabetes or who don't prevent 80% of heart disease or have patients with a second stent. And once they find that, they're angry as you know what. I'm not, I'm the same persuasion as John, so I'm not gonna say the word, but it's like, you've gotta be kidding me. As the CEO of that company said, he said, Mike, these are not diseases, these are defects. Something that's 90% preventable, type 2 diabetes, something that's 80% preventable, cardiovascular, that's not a disease, but if you call it a disease and send it off to somebody in a white coat, they're gonna treat it with a medication and a stent and they're not gonna give, we will engineer out these diseases, at least as we control our environment and we control our food supply, and we control the types of models that Victoria just talked about, which they offer on site until eight o'clock at night and on Saturdays with teaching kitchens. So the large self-insured employers who get the truth are our best leverage point, and will put pressure appropriately on our delivery systems to create greater, faster VOI, not just near-term medical cost savings, but total productivity costs. So we'll talk offline, but the problem with the meta-analysis thing is that there's not a single agency of the federal government that's vested in that, despite names like the Department of Commerce, you think they would be, we've explored that. We have some large data sets, something called work partners, if anybody wants to talk to me offline, and some of the models we've done with what I call rapid intensive lifestyle disease reversal, but it only pays near-term and medical costs for the sickest of the sick. So you've got to get to those people that Whole Foods gets to and says that you're on five or more chronic conditions, you're on 10 or more medications, you're in that top three to 5%, and within weeks, we will drop it. And then, so what I can't do is offer that program to a vanilla population of low to moderate risk, because it does not pay in the terms and the cycle time that employers need. So thinking smartly about how we deploy these interventions, coffee talk with Dexter, 
but you hit the nail on the head. So the health, what I wrote in Victoria, health services research is something that also has to be in this white paper that has that discussion there. So thank you. Dexter. Well, uh, thanks. I didn't come up to the mic. Two things are what you're talking about. Uh, one is that uh, we participate in a lot of programs where we would send our, our employees to these programs. They would reverse their type 2 diabetes. They would get off all their medications, a great near-term ROI, but then when they went back into their communities and into the main way of living or whatever, I guess that often is what I see, um, they would go back to their medications. So it was like sending someone to AA, we get them off the alcohol, and then we put them in a bar so I think that really speaks to the larger conversation we've been having about the environment and why some of the things, some of those things are just as important as some of our interventions. That's one thing. The other thing is, to Mike's point, um, our CEO was so frustrated in terms of, uh, you know, health quality and the conversations we were having about high performance networks and ACOs. And a lot of it had to do with access to care and just you know, checking the box on process measures, but not really moving the needle in terms of cost. And he said, for us, and we manufacture diesel engines, Cummins engines. And uh, he said, for us, that would be like us just saying, well, the way we're going to fix a defect in our engine is we're going to have more repair shops and more mechanics. And that really doesn't get to the root cause. And so he was really frustrated, and that's what really led to some of the things that we were doing. The third piece on this is that employers are a very good place to start because they have all of their data. Usually they're ERISA, they're self-funded, which means that they have their medical data as well as their uh, pharmaceutical data. A lot of the physicians and hospital systems don't have the pharmaceutical data. And one of the places where we saw the greatest re uh, reduction in costs is on the pharmaceutical side. So if you don't have that data, you're not playing right for the day. One other thing in terms of cost is that, so I'm the current president of American College of Lifestyle Medicine. We have a group called the Lifestyle Medicine Economic Research Group, and it's intended by a, a PhD out of Tufts, and it's intended to do just what you're talking about, putting together all the economic stuff. So I would say to anyone in the group, if you have economic data you want to share with us, we would love to put it in our repository and do some research and work around that, and also spread the message. Now, the reason I actually came up here <laughs> I told you he's a wealth of info. Go ahead. Was uh, to respond to something Victoria said about the definition of lifestyle medicine. So as the president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, David Katz is a former past president. Uh, Lynn Dysinger is another former pr past president. And we thought for sure, because we always, what's that? Oh, and the young too, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. So many of us are here. And so we thought for sure, because we always talk about lifestyle medicine is for the prevention the treatment and the reversal of disease. And so I wanted to make sure that, that you knew that, and I was actually going to pull it up and, and show you, but you know what? It's not there. So we're all just kind of surprised as well, so uh, we're gonna go back and we'll fix that, but we always speak about prevention as well. So this Good pick up, there. good pick up. And good pick up, yeah. And finally, uh, Jeanette Southpaw, one of, one of uh, many of our heroes here at Pitt and in a former life in the military as a colleague, so Jeanette. Sorry, I know your time is short. Oh, I'm Jeanette Southpaw, oh, Chair of Family yeah. Medicine here at Pitt and UPMC. I just wanted to comment and echo some of the things that have been said, I agree. And I wanted to go back to the con concept of spirituality because that is actually not only an anchoring theme in how people make decisions about their health and their lives, it's one of those cultural determinants and that's something that I've spent a lot of time in terms of education here about understanding the culture of the population we serve. And the reality is if we don't keep that in mind as we're looking at the cost issues, we're going to focus so much of our interventions about reducing cost that we are going to actually be diametrically opposed to attending to the culture of our patients. And we've seen some of that in some of the work that we've done in looking at issues related to women's health where we found that one of the things we're incentivized as primary care physicians to do is getting people out of the hospital quickly and reducing 30-day admits. We all know this. And we have incentivized physicians to make decisions that are done in a timely fashion before patients leave the hospital. And what we found in some of the focus groups that we've done on issues related to contraception, where a quality indicator by our insurers and our health systems are to make sure people are on certain types of contraception 
quadriceps is within 24 hours of delivery. And when we talked to the patients, what they said was, this is something that is important to me that I have, I do really well. I don't have a great job, I don't make a lot of money, I don't live in the best communities, but I know how to make a baby. And before I even cross my legs and get off the table, you wanna make sure that I am on, on some sort of medicine to prevent me doing something that I do really well. And so I think that as we start looking at some of the issues, the, the incentives in the insurers are for us as physicians to do things better to save costs for the system. Those are not incentives for the patients. And until we start figuring out the best incentives for the patients, we're not gonna get to any of these positive things we want. Sorry to 